but what was the theatre like that Edward Gordon Craig grew up in? Well, it, it was very different from the theatre today. Um, I think there were uh, certainly two major differences. Uh, first of all, um, there was what we call pictorial realism. And that means that the, uh, when you went to the theatre, you actually saw on stage a real building. It was actually made of wood, but it appeared like a church or it appeared like uh, a tavern. But it was, in every single detail, it was realistic. Now, this, of course, uh, meant that when they changed the set, it took a long time. And so the Victorian theatre, uh, you went to the theatre sometimes for four and a half hours, and in between the scenes, they had music played. So there was always an orchestra. So you went to see Macbeth, and while they changed from uh, the Heath at the beginning of the uh, beginning of the, the play uh, to the Macbeth's castle. You probably had uh, Arthur Sullivan's music lasting for 15 minutes. So it was quite slow. If you think of Victorian painting, uh, you will know that it was very very realistic. And essentially, a play was a moving picture, and the frame was the proscenium arch. So you actually saw a picture moving. So that was the first thing that was different. The second thing that was different was that the play was directed by the leading actor. We call him the actor manager. Uh, and so consequently, he acted the leading part and he also directed the play. So what do you think that meant? what could probably happen if the leading actor was actually directing the play. Take quite a long time to rehearse, we, keep alternating parts. Well, that's, that's certainly true. Yeah, uh, but uh, who do you think would be the person emphasised in every scene? Mm, the lead. The lead. Uh, the, 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 in other words, the, the actor manager tended to put himself in the centre stage. He was always looked at, and the audience went to see the actor manager. So consequently, Henry Irving was probably the greatest in the second part of the century, greatest actor manager, and there was somebody called Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree. And when they felt that the play needed a little bit of addition, for example. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, King John by Shakespeare. King John by Shakespeare does not have a scene with Magna Carta. Now, the one thing that the audience knew in, in the Victorian days was Magna Carta. So Tree, when he produced uh, King John, actually introduced a silent scene of King John signing the Magna Carta with all his barons around him, so that with music playing, so consequently with very realistic Runnymede, trees all painted beautifully, uh, and so consequently uh, there, there you've got pictorial realism plus the actor manager, because that, sitting in the middle signing the Magna Carta was Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree. What was his relationship to his mother as a child and as a grown-up? Um, well, he adored his mother. Um, he didn't really have a father because uh, he was an illegitimate boy. Um, Ellen Terry, his mother, the leading actress of the Victorian stage, um, uh, had a five-year relationship with a man called Edward Godwin, who was a famous architect. And they had two children together, and the younger of the two children was Edward Gordon Craig. So he was essentially always brought up by his mother, and he was really mummy's boy. Uh, and he adored his mother, both as an actress and as a mum. Um, and so consequently, she also doted on him, her only boy. So consequently, uh, she did everything she could to help him. And when he was 17, he was very good looking, and uh, he thought he would like to go on the stage. So she persuaded Henry Irving, who was she, was, she acted with Henry Irving's company, uh, to let little Edward Gordon to, to act. And he then acted a number of plays for about eight years and created quite a good impression for himself. So consequently, uh, he was an actor 
acting with his mother. And there's a great moment when he had to pick her up. It was um, a play called Cymbeline by Shakespeare. And she was playing Imogen, and he was playing uh, a young lad, Arverigus. And there's a scene when it's thought that uh, Imogen has died. Uh, and so he ha she has to be picked up. And Gordon Craig picked up his mother. She was quite heavy. But he said, in fact, uh, it was, she was as light as a feather when he picked her up. So, so that was the first thing uh, to, to start with. As a boy, uh, he and his mother got on very well. When he started to direct plays, uh, he relied on his mother in a different way. He wanted finance. And so she provided the money for many of his early productions. Uh, she was very happy to do this. Uh, he perhaps took a little bit of advantage of it. But nevertheless, uh, he, uh, she did finance at least five uh, of his early plays. Um, she died in 1928. Uh, and Five years later, he wrote this book <clears throat> about her. Uh, and you can see the title. It's called Ellen Terry and Her Secret Self. And Craig said that his mother was known to the world <clears throat> as a great actress. But he knew her as a woman. And so what he tries to do in that book is to show the difference between the great actress and the human being. Um, you said that, obviously, Ellen Terry was an actress. Did they move around a lot together? So did that disrupt like his childhood and the sort of sense of making friends and bonding in a community? Or did, did they just stay in one place and go to the same theatre? They tended uh, to stay in the same theatre uh, for most of the year in the Lyceum in London. Uh, that was where, where Irving had his company. However, uh, for at least three months every year, they did tour. And uh, when he was a little boy, uh, Craig toured with his mother. The most interesting thing was when he went to America. He went to America twice with his mother, um, and she persuaded him. He was only six and eight uh, during that time. And uh, she then persuaded him to come on the stage as a little boy in two plays, actually. Uh, and so he got his first experience of acting in America uh, as a non-speaking part in one of his mother's plays. Do you think that that gave him a big like taste for I think it uh, I think it did. I, make it big. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that's true, yes. But of course, the theatre that he acted in was very different from the theatre that he talked about in his books. Because, of course, he was, although he admired Henry Irving greatly, uh, he uh, thought that theatre should change and be different from this rather pedestrian uh, Victorian theatre. And so he spent most of his life, in fact, um, going against uh, his early experiences on stage. What about his school life, his education? Ah, oh, now this is really quite interesting. Um, he uh, was educated as a little boy by uh, his nanny. Um, and then he was sent to a public school, Bradfield's College uh, in England. And he hated it uh, and eventually got himself expelled. Um, and so he was then sent by his mother uh, to uh, what I suppose we call a crammer today uh, in Germany. Uh, and, uh, and he enjoyed that rather more, partly, I suspect, because he went out and took, got the odd drink in the evening and no doubt smoked a cigarette, uh, that sort of thing, as, as boys do. Did the German culture like, influence his work, like notably, or...? Uh, not then, um, not then, but later on. I think that you can't understand Craig uh, unless you understand that he was a European. Uh, he essentially had to reject England. Like Lord Byron, he had to leave, leave England uh, because uh, England just wouldn't understand what he was trying to do. In spite of the fact that he wrote books in English, um, they didn't understand his theories. But the Europeans did, and many of his, uh, many of his great um, uh, fr friends later on were, were German. Count Kessler, good example. Count Kessler, with whom he uh, did the Cranach Press Hamlet, good German friend.
mean? English are very traditional. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think you're, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, the difference between England and Europe was that Europe was experimenting, had been experimenting for about 20, 20 years before Craig ever went over there. Mm. I mean, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, European playwrights were exploring uh, subject matter that was completely unacceptable in England. I mean, Ibsen, uh, the, the great Norwegian uh, uh, dramatist, um, I mean, was talking about venereal disease, for example, a whole play, uh, 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 women's rights, uh, I mean, in the, a doll's house. Um, the um, heroine, at the end of the play, uh, leaves her husband, who's, and she was treating her like a doll, uh, and, and actually the bashes the back door, you hear the, the end of the play, and uh, people said that you heard back doors cl breaking, clashing throughout Europe afterwards, because when people saw the play. Um, so it was a revolutionary theatre, uh, much more so, and also in production too, uh, there was a little German state called Sax Meinerhen, and the Duke of Sax Meinerhen had his own company, and he was uh, introducing brand new ideas, particularly uh, about um, the extras in a play. Every single extra in a Sax Meinerhen production uh, had his own or her own own part. They weren't just merely extras, oh, one of the 100 that Irving used uh, in his Othello or something like that. Uh, they were real individuals. There were all sorts of ideas floating about in Europe, some of which uh, Craig read about and adapted. Uh, a good example for that would be uh, there was a Swiss man called Adolf Appiah, and uh, he was very interested in lighting. Uh, and lighting effects, um, and many of Craig's ideas on using light on, in, in the theatre come from Appiah. They're slightly different, but he certainly knew Appiah's work and had met Appiah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, Europe is absolutely vital uh, for, for, for Craig. Did he do any, like, collaborations with other People. Well, I mean, yeah, yes, I mean, his most famous collaboration was with Stanislavski, the great uh, Russian director, who invited him over uh, to um, uh, Moscow uh, to direct Hamlet. And this was a production that took them, both men, uh, two years. Uh, in gestation. I mean, they worked at it for two years. Craig went over to Moscow for at least three occasions, worked with Stanislavski, and then at the beginning of uh, 1912, uh, he actually produced the play, and it was revolutionary. I mean, it was it, people had never seen a, a Hamlet uh, like this before. And it, there was a lot of Stanislavski uh, in it, as well as Craig. Uh, the main ideas were Craig's. But uh, he had some ideas that were not practical. And uh, so Stanislavski had to tone them down a little bit. And so consequently, um, uh, eventually, it was a compromise. Um, <clears throat> let, me give you, let me give you a, a good example of that. In the famous uh, soliloquy, to be or not to be, um, Craig wanted death to approach Hamlet. Come in, stand behind Hamlet, and then when Hamlet decides not to commit suicide, to disappear on the opposite side of the stage. They tried it. They experimented in rehearsal, but it didn't really work. People wondered who this strange person simulating death was, and so consequently, eventually, they abandoned it. But it was a, a very Good idea. And in fact, uh, here, I don't know whether you can see this, this is a black figure. This is, let me just explain what this is. This is one of the models that Craig took with him to Moscow. Um, and it's Hamlet. Can you see and Hamlet? And can you see a figure behind Hamlet? And that is his daemon or death standing behind him. Now, that is what Craig wanted to happen on stage, but sadly it didn't because it didn't work on stage. But it works pictorially. And so consequently, this was originally white, a white piece of wood. Just feel it, how light it is. 
very light. And it's, it's because it's made of fruit wood. It's probably made of pear tree or something like that. All right? Now then, what he did was, uh, after he came back from Moscow, he, he decided, wouldn't that be interesting if I put some ink on it and then put it down like this on a piece of paper uh, and see what happens? And I will show you what happens. That is what happens. So that, in fact, let me show it. Can you see it clearly? Now, what we've got there is a black, what is one of his black figures. And this, in fact, is the actual model that he took with him of Hamlet to Moscow, now in England, inked and actually made very, very dramatic uh, pictorially. Uh, what was the key vision he had for the new theatre? And what were his like, influences? Like, what did he want to see? Gosh, uh, what does he want to see? Uh, well, can I say straight away that he never actually quite saw what his, his vision. Um, he was like a mosquito in England. He, he was buzzing around and, and he would sort of prick people and say, come on, wake up, wake up. And, 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 and they would say, oh, go away, mosquito. <laughs> and so essentially he, he had to go to Europe uh, for, for some of his best things, as we've said. Now, what about what were his ideas? Well, obviously, the, one of his ideas uh, was scenery. Uh, he didn't believe in this pictorial re realism um, of the uh, of the uh, Victorian stage. I'd like to can I show you just to give you some idea. This is this is a picture of Henry Irving's production uh, of a play called Dante. Now you can see it's an inside of a church. Can you see that quite clearly? Uh, and it's all painted as the church would have been painted. And in the distance, can you see there's, there's a lake, there's a, some trees, all painted. It's incredibly realistic. Now, as we said before, that took time to set up uh, and it was rather pedestrian. Now, here's another picture, and this is from the Moscow Hamlet, and this comes from his little model theatre. Now, this is a scene in the castle at Elsinore. Um, on the left of the picture, you can see a small chapel. It doesn't look like a chapel at all. It just looks like a sort of hutch, or like a rabbit hutch almost. Uh, there. But in fact, when Claudius went into his chapel to pray, Craig used lighting to give the effect of stained glass windows, to give the effect of and play, played uh, appropriate music, so that if it was now look at the rest of the picture, and what does it? What sort of things do you think that suggests for a castle? Any, anything about it that uh, it, it does it look um, plenty of space or or does it look a little bit sort of perhaps claustrophobic? Very claustrophobic. Very claustrophobic. Exactly. That's exactly what Craig was trying to achieve because Hamlet says Denmark's a prison. Denmark's a prison, and the castle is a prison. The whole of Hamlet is is about somebody being imprisoned in all sorts of metaphorical as well as, uh, as um, literal, literal ways. Now, if you look carefully at what those, that, that scenery, can you see that they are, in fact, screens? Can you see screens that, in fact, have, have got hinges on them? Um, the, the screens are here, 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 and here, all right? Now, that screen, those screens, could in a moment, literally not, with no music, just a quick blackout, they could be quickly, using the hinges, turned into something different for the next scene. Look at this one. Those are the same, the same, absolutely the same um, screens. This time, there could be a forest or they could be pillars. I mean, absolutely. Now, in fact, that is, was, was his great discovery, one of his great inventions, screens. So the first thing that we're talking about Craig um, was the fact that he completely altered scenery. Scenery is no longer realistic. Scenery is more symbolic. Now, one of the things that Craig felt about the theatre was that theatre was magic. And 
he wanted to create mood and atmosphere, more important than pictorial real reality. And so consequently, what he was able to do was to create this by simple scenery, beautiful lighting. Lighting is absolutely crucial to, uh, to, to, to Craig. And create this with his actors, who <coughs> in a way became almost puppets. He manages to create the scene, the people create this wonderful atmosphere. Now, I mentioned the word puppet. One of the problems with Craig was that he was very dubious about certain types of actors. He didn't like actors who showed off, who drew attention to themselves. They had to be part of something bigger. And Craig's great, I suppose, contribution to 20th century theatre was the role of the director. I mentioned before that uh, the actors themselves used to direct, actor managers. Now, in the 20th century, round about 1950, perhaps a little bit earlier, uh, we be began to get men and women, thank goodness, a few women, uh, who actually just directed. Now, their vision of the play was not an actor's vision. It was an external vision. It was their vision. And this is what Craig had. Craig had a vision. Craig was the director. But it, today we have a lighting expert, we have a sound expert, and we have a director. In fact, Craig wanted to be director, lighting expert, sound expert, absolutely everything, to create this magical theatre. But, but quite honestly, without Craig, I think we can confidently say there would never have been a Peter Brook, there would never have been a Peter Hall. Uh, the, the director comes from Craig's writing. Um, you said earlier that he didn't really live to see his entire vision like actually Correct. created. Is that because he was trying to tackle so many things at once and didn't, did he not trust other people to do different aspects uh, of... Yeah, yes, uh, yeah, yes, I think he did. And I mean, he was obviously very pleased with the, the, the Moscow Hamlet. And, and I mean, he did, he did, I, I mustn't exaggerate, but I mean, he did see small little individual successes. I mean, one of his great successes was uh, in Florence, in Italy. He directed a play called Rosmer's Home by Ibsen. Uh, and uh, he had a fabulous actress, Italian actress, called Eleonora Duse. It, the play was in Italian. Uh, Eleonora Duse uh, playing, uh, playing in uh, Rosmer's home. Uh, and that was, again, a, a, a great success. But he never saw his ideas accepted, certainly in England. He, he, just before he died, uh, he got to know people like Laurence Olivier, Peter Brook, Peter Brook visited Craig, talked to Craig. When Peter Brook was a young man, Peter Brook, you may not have heard of, but he is now in his 90s and he is still directing. And he is a, a, a genius as, 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 as a director. And so he did know uh, he was alive when uh, Peter Brook was directing. But I don't think he ever saw a Peter Brook in fact, I'm sure he didn't see a Peter Brook production because they were all in England. Uh, Peter Brook now directs in Paris, um, but uh, but in fact, in those days, he was acting, he was producing in uh, only in England, and uh, Craig never went back to England uh, apart from the to the funeral of his mother. Uh, uh, really, he he lived in uh, France most of the time towards the end of his life. The way he used this scenery idea, did, that, did he use that technique with all of his other...? Not all of them, no. Um, the, the, he used them, it's a very good question, um, he used it in Moscow. And he used it in Dublin uh, with W.B. Yeats. He directed some plays for Yeats. Uh, and so he, there, he actually uh, used 
the screens. No, he used all sorts of other ideas. I mean, I mean, steps were one of the great, wonderful ideas using flights of steps. I mean, that was another thing here. And he also uh, used to do wonderful things with what we call the psych, the cyclorama at the back of the, the theatre. And he used to light the cyclorama in exciting and f a completely original and new, new ideas. So, no, he had all sorts of, all sorts of ideas. It depended on the play. I mean, it depended on the play. I mean, uh, the screens were suitable for certain plays, but perhaps not, not for others, you know. I mean, that, that, that was right. Did he use other um, coloured lighting, or was it literally just white light? He loved coloured lighting, but it wasn't just colour. He also used lighting from uh, strange places that it had never been used before. He would actually use spots in the wings shining down. So he was able to get slanting light. Now to get slanting light he realized you needed some sort of dust to pick up the light beam and so he had he was probably one of the first people to use chalk dust uh, to, to, to create that slanting light. Uh, but I would have thought his earliest plays probably showed uh, his most innovative lighting, uh, surprisingly. Uh, 1901, 1902, he directed Dido and Aeneas and Asis and Galatea, uh, and they were amateur productions. They weren't in uh, the West End or anything like that, uh, but uh, they, were, they, were, they had all sorts of new, fresh ideas uh, with lighting. Did anyone inspire him to like use these different techniques, like, to use the lighting in different ways? Well, um, Adolf Appiah had written on lighting, uh, but no, I think most of Craig's uh, uses of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of light were, were his own. I mean, they were original, completely original, yeah. How did Craig put forward his ideas? Well, one of the ways in which he was able to put forward his ideas was not in books, but actually in a magazine. And in 1908, in March, he published this. He was in Florence at the time, he was in Italy, uh, and he started a magazine called The Mask, a monthly journal of the art of the theatre. And this really is the first important the theatrical magazine in Europe. Uh, and in it, uh, he writes on Renaissance theatre, he talks about the present day, he talks about anything to do with the theatre. A note on masks, for example. The thing is called the mask, and then he talks about how do we use masks. Now, in the Commedia dell'arte in Italy, uh, in the Renaissance times, they used masks, and so consequently there is, there is an article on masks in the very first edition. But essentially, this was a means of Craig putting forward new ideas. Now, when you look at a copy, you'll see, uh, for example, a note on masks by John Balance. Uh, you'll see, uh, let's see whether we can find another one. Edward Hutton is actually a real person. Uh, but John Balance is not a real person. He's Craig under a pseudonym. So what we're saying is that this, this magazine is virtually written 90% by Craig under pseudonyms to start with. He does get, eventually, people writing for it. But virtually, every single issue has 50% of Craig in it, at least. So consequently, now this runs, and this is amazing, for 20 years. And it starts uh, in this folio format uh, and it is every month. So we start uh, March, April, May, June, uh, that's fine. But towards the end it only comes out quarterly and it's always in this orange wrapper. Uh, for half its existence it had this orange wrapper, but still it has got uh, articles uh, about illustrations by Craig. Um, uh, this is um, some extracts from the practice of making scenes and machines in theatres, uh, book reviews, anything to do with the theatre uh, is in this book. Um, and it went over Europe. They, we have actually got in the library uh, some of the stickers that went on envelopes sending out from Florence to Prague, 
to Russia, uh, to all, all over Europe, Spain, this in English, it was never translated into another language. This went all over Europe. And there is no question uh, that it was very, very important. Quite how important I, is, is obviously difficult to assess. But we know that it was read uh, by some of the young men and women who were actually going to um, become important figures in the theatre. And um, why did he use so many pseudonyms? Why didn't he just say, this is my magazine, I'm going to write for it? Uh, well, I, th <laughs> I think he wanted to persuade the public uh, that they, there was, it wasn't just a one-man show, it was actually much bigger, and, and, and that's the reason. So consequently, all these p people's names. I mean, I think there's a list of uh, 40 or 50 different names <laughs> that he used uh, in writing these articles. And if it was an article, say, on uh, marionettes, it would be by somebody, and then it, so you, you got to know these people. But having said that, I mean, uh, Hutton, for example, Edward Hutton, uh, was a, a, a genuine person in the, in the first issue. I mean, there was, there was an Edward Hutton. He published books, and he wrote for The Mask. So uh, he did have supporters, and uh, he would obviously consider uh, articles for The Mask. Like you said earlier, his, um, his school shut down um, mm -hmm. because of the war. Um, would you say that this was a much better way to like give his ideas and not teachings but kind of like the layout of what but it, it went further didn't it i mean it went into other countries i mean a, a school a, a, a a theatre school in Florence is marvellous, but on the other hand, and obviously there are very, very famous, I mean, in England we've got the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, obviously, uh, in, in London uh, today, and that's been running since about the time of, of, of the mask, actually, um, but, uh, and people know about that. But a school by itself is never going to actually put forward ideas as well as a magazine, I think. And I mean, after all, here we've got, I mean, obviously we we have in, in our library two or three copies uh, in different formats uh, of every issue. And so consequently, you know, and throughout libraries in Europe, there will be copies of the mask. So p people can read today what Craig was writing. The danger with a university or a, a drama school is, is that, you know, it's just the few people who are lucky enough to go there and they can then talk about it. What is relationship with Irving? Irving was his f lost father, really. Um, he hadn't got a father, and so Irving became his father. I Irving acted in a very different way from the way people acted in the 20th century. Yet, Craig admired him so much that he said that uh, his acting transcended the conventions of his day. In other words, he was an actor who was an actor in his bones, in his body. I mean, he, he was a great actor. Now, in fact, Irving was criticised a lot because he had a rather large nose uh, and, and he tended to speak through his nose and he was also quite tall um, and he was really quite clumsy. But he was such a magnetic actor, particularly in melodrama and in Shakespeare, um, that people forgot that. And um, Irving analysed uh, the way uh, 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 Irving acted. Uh, Craig analysed how Irving acted, and he wrote a book about. He wrote a book about his mother. He also wrote a book about Irving, um, and this again was just after he written the book about his mother, uh, and uh, this was uh, analysed the way uh, Irving acted. So consequently, although all Craig's work went against what Irving believed a theatre should be, Craig could admire the greatness in the man. I understand that Gordon Craig like shaped theatre today. Mm -hmm. um, is there any examples where they've, like in modern day theatre or even television where they've used his ideas, but like, I get that it's evolved over the years, but is it still like very- Well, let, let, me, let me tell you a story. I, I was in um, Germany and looking at an opera in Germany at a place called Bayreuth. It was a Wagner opera, and it was called Tannhäuser. And um, the curtain went up for Act One, 
And I suddenly looked at the set and it had got these strips uh, of fabric. It was all made of strips of fabric, right, like a tent, entirely cribbed from Edward Gordon Craig, entirely. So that was about 15 years ago. Uh, all the time, people are using Craig's ideas uh, all, all the time. Now, uh, they're not obviously imitating a whole production uh, uh, like Craig, but it's the incidental ideas that, he's, that he introduced are still being used today. Steps, steps. Um, uh, the, the whole idea of different levels, putting people on different levels, you know, all that is in, in Craig production. You'll see it all today. You know, uh, it, it, so, so there's, a, there's a lot. Uh, most people uh, who uh, are in the theatre have read Craig uh, and, and therefore maybe intentionally, maybe completely unintentionally um, uh, can, uh, use, it, use some of his ideas. What, have you seen War Horse? Yeah. yeah. No, that, that, is that is an amazing, amazing. production. <laughs> but now Warhorse, but yes, but, but Craig, I mean, the, the whole idea of the puppet, he used puppets. It's, it's, it's really good because the horse is ultimately a large puppet, isn't it? Um, but and um, manipulated by two or two, two people, is it? How many people manipulate the horse in yeah, Warhorse? Two, 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 two people, yes. Now, um, in fact, it's quite interesting that, that we're talking about Warhorse because Craig never suggested anywhere in his writings that you could have a puppet horse. However, Craig did suggest that you could have puppets on stage. And therefore, the whole idea of puppetry in a play with live actors indirectly comes from Craig. So to a certain extent, you could say that he had an influence on Warhorse, though he himself, of course, would never have actually suggested the actual idea. That was somebody else's idea. But the whole idea of having puppets, and if you think about it, there have been uh, a number of plays in the last 20 years, certainly, with using puppets. And, and, and again, this Craig would have been delighted. I mean, let us say straight away, if Craig had seen Warhorse, he would have been absolutely thrilled, and he would have said, that's theatre. Mm -hmm. And so that's the important thing. The black figures, um, how did they like evolve over the years? Or did they just stay the same throughout? Uh, oh, no, this is quite interesting. Now, I showed you, um, you remember, um, a picture of, sorry, a, a, a black figure of, of Hamlet. Uh, now, um, that's how it all started. He used just his Hamlet figures. So he had about six or so of them, uh, and he used those, and they, 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 they survive uh, as prints. Then he realized that this was rather a good way of actually creating uh, effects, uh, or, uh, woodcut effects, different from gouging out a wood block, uh, but nevertheless a totally different way. And so what he then started to do was to make black figures, or white figures, making them black by ink, um, that were nothing to do with the theatre. So, so the, it starts then um, with theatre design, and it then goes on to something else. Uh, some of the other subjects, he did Beauty and the Beast, for example. He did a rather interesting self-portrait. Uh, of himself. So it, 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 there were a whole series of black figures, uh, probably about 50, about 50. Some were plays he never produced. Uh, one, Merchant of Venice, he did a wonderful Shylock. He did a wonderful, and in that play, he did uh, Old Gobbo and Young Gobbo and also Portia. So consequently, you know, there were, there, there were some from plays that he, that he did, hadn't ever wasn't even considering producing, um, but uh, they, ma they made these, these black figures. But the black figures are different from his woodcuts because he also did about 200 woodcuts uh, in his life. He was, a, he was a natural artist. But why is he so such an advocate for change and like, oh, I can't think of the right word, but then he's like shunning his sister. I don't get that because he's trying to... He loved his sister's theatre. Uh, I mean, his sister uh, directed plays, as you probably know, uh, and quite unusual plays. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and he used to go, I mean, 
he didn't see many of them because they were mainly in in London. But he wrote to her about them and 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 was you know really genuinely interested in them. It was only towards the end of her life um, when she was really taken over by these other women, uh, and he they were they were living in Ellen Terry's house. You know, it was a very sad situation, and and uh, and he just found it, it, it quite impossible. He virtually broke off with her for the last few years of of his life only. Uh, but uh, no, they were they were. He loved his sister. Who would you say the most important woman in his life was? There is one woman who is absolutely crucial uh, to and who remained faithful to him throughout his entire life, and her name was Eleanor. Mayo, Eleanor Mayo, M-E-O. She was an Italian and he met her when she was 18 and she was a violin student at um, London Music College um, and they fell in love uh, and they lived together for a short time and they had two children. Uh, so they were called Teddy and Nellie and uh, Eleanor Mayo uh, was really uh, his common law wife. Uh, for p long periods during his life, uh, she lived with Craig and her children, uh, and she went over to Italy and lived with him in Italy, uh, and uh, outlived him by a year or two, uh, and she was magnificent. She helped him uh, in some of his schemes. She acted as a secretary uh, and uh, again she brought up these two delightful children. Now those children, uh, Teddy uh, and Nellie, were his favourite children. Uh, and um, Nellie was looked after him when he was a very old man and was with him when he died in his 90s. Uh, and Teddy uh, was, he hoped that Teddy was going to become his assistant and Teddy helped with the printing of the Cranach Press Hamlet so he was in Weimar uh, with Craig uh, in the pr printing of that famous book uh, and um, but he found his father just a little bit too demanding uh, and so he fell in love with a delightful woman and he got married fairly young too, uh, rather more successfully than his father, uh, and, um, uh, and so consequently separated but never, uh, never lost touch with his father. Uh, and um, he was a, Teddy was a great designer for films. So he, he, he called himself Edward Carrick, Edward Carrick, uh, and he was a very gifted, gifted uh, man himself. And in fact, I knew Teddy very well as an old man he, he, he and I met and that's one of the reasons why Ethan has got this marvellous Craig collection because most of it uh, belonged to Teddy uh, and uh, we acquired it from Teddy. His school in Italy is, is really interesting. Um, it's in Florence um, and it was called the Arena Goldoni. Uh, and it was a sort of, it was already a small open air theatre. Uh, so it had got a, a so rather like a little Roman theatre, if you can imagine it. It was probably built um, at the middle of the Victorian age, I should think. Um, and so he found this theatre in, in Italy, this open air theatre, and he decided he would may open a school in which he could promulgate some of his ideas. Um, and uh, so this was about 1913 when he found it, perhaps 1912 when he actually found it. He was living in Florence at the time uh, and so consequently uh, he then decided uh, to advertise this school and he worked um, with uh, a number of his friends uh, making a, a syllabus and the theatre was go this school was going to uh, teach all sorts of things it was going to uh, teach co how to make costumes it was going to uh, produce little plays uh, so direction was very very important um, lighting uh, puppetry all these things were actually uh, in the syllabus now he managed to get about a dozen 
undergraduates, we must call them undergraduates, uh, to this school, about a dozen. Um, and we've got photographs of them working and for about nine months the this, this school worked very, very well. And, and he was pleased, Craig was pleased, and he had other people teaching, he wasn't the only person teaching, um, and uh, these, it, it, they were all men. I don't think there was a woman uh, among the students, I think they were all men. Uh, but anyway, um, they all worked extremely well, and then the First World War started. And the First World War, of course, Italy was in the war with Britain, uh, uh, against Germany uh, and uh, he couldn't get any finance everybody was concerned with the war and so consequently the whole thing fizzled unfortunately and he was devastated because you know this was an opportunity for him to actually put a f with with one or two really faithful co-workers uh, to, to actually you know Get, get some of um, his ideas across uh, to the general public, and he couldn't. So it was, it was rather sad, but it, it did work, and it worked, as I say, well for almost a year.